Mr. Kiley is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. In recent years, we have seen a movement to fundamentally change America's approach to law and order by defunding police departments and by putting so-called progressive prosecutors in district attorney's offices. Uh, Mr. DiGiacomo, you are the head of the uh, New York Detectives Endowment Association. Uh, what connection do you see between these two things, defund the police and progressive prosecutors? Well, you know, uh, they're, they're following uh, the progressive line and not backing the police, not uh, caring about the victims, and uh, putting the criminal element back out onto the street to victimize the people of, uh, of this uh, city and state and country. That's right. Both seek to eliminate or neutralize uh, the capabilities of law enforcement, correct? Uh, well, it's, it's been compromised already. That's right. And thereby removing or reducing the consequences of criminal activity, correct? Mm -hmm. Correct. So these policies have uh, gained a major foothold in several cities, including uh, the one that we're in right now. So we can assess what the impact has been. And one way to assess that impact, of course, is looking at the effect on crime rates. Uh, now, Mr. Holden, you're an elected uh, city council member uh, in New York, a uh, member of the Democratic uh, Party, and uh, you testified today about failed progressive policies. So just to be clear, when you say these are failed progressive policies, uh, is that because they've caused crime to go up or to go down? Uh, again, uh, I'm a critic of, of my party's stance on, on crime. It, everything's gone up. All their policies have led to an increase in crime. And, and I think we saw it come to a head with um, the war on police that, that started after George Floyd, and it went national. And so you saw this kind of crime wave go throughout the entire country. That's right. And in fact, if you look at uh, yesterday's New York Times, uh, it reported that major crime in New York this year is 45% up from two years ago. This is from the New York Times. And to your point, in Los Angeles, violent crime is 86% higher than the national average. In San Francisco, overall crime is 111% higher than the national average. So you can also then look to assess the impact uh, of these policies uh, how, about how people are responding to them. Uh, would you say, Council uh, Member Holden, that these failed progressive policies have caused more people to move to New York City or to move away from New York City? Certainly away from New York City. I've never seen it this bad. And like I said, I grew up in the, in the 80s and 90s in New York, and I saw horrific crime numbers. But now it's much, much worse because it's all over. The, the, the lawlessness mayhem is all over. And in fact, uh, the state of New York is second in the nation in terms of one-way U-Haul and rentals, people who are leaving. Uh, first place, of course, is California now, uh, three years running. Uh, Los Angeles County, where George Gascon is the district attorney, accounts for half the people leaving California. And San Francisco, its population is declining faster than any major city in U.S. history. Now, a final way we can assess the impact of these policies is by the judgment of voters. Uh, Council Member Holden, would you say that, uh, mayoral, uh, that Mayor Eric Adams uh, made the issue of crime a, success, a plank in his, major plank in his successful campaign for mayor? Well, th that was and, and, and certainly is, but he's not getting much support from his colleagues. Correct. And in Los Angeles, uh, George Gascon has been subject to a vote of no confidence by 36 different city councils within his jurisdiction. And San Francisco voters went so far as to recall their pro progressive prosecutor from office overwhelmingly. Now, this is not a red city. The Trump-Pence ticket got 12 percent in San Francisco, and yet voters overwhelmingly recalled that progressive prosecutor. And so the verdict is very clear that these policies have led to crime skyrocketing, to people fleeing, and they're being rejected by voters. And yet today, on the other side of the table, we have by and large saw members of Congress standing by those policies. And for folks who are watching, and for that matter, the victims and the families who are here today, it must be disheartening. But I'd say it's actually not as bleak as it sounds, that in fact the voices that we have heard today on the other side are not representative. And for proof of that, just look what happened in D.C. after the city council there passed a reckless crime bill. In the House majority, we passed legislation to undo what the D.C. city council had done. President Biden signed with us and signed that bill. Two out of three Democrat senators sided with us and voted for that bill. Do you know how many members of this committee on, in the minority voted for that bill? Just one. Every single other member voted to keep the reckless pro-criminal 
DC crime bill in place. So I would say there's a lot more consensus in this country right now than today's hearing uh, makes out, uh, and that the pendulum is swinging back towards supporting victims, supporting law enforcement, supporting law and order, and I look forward to working with people of good faith on both sides of the aisle to restore sanity to our criminal justice system. Gentlemen's time's expired.